What's up, y'all? Reggie here for the Utopian Project. And I just want to do, you know, some more videos in this um, glorification of coke, crack, dealing, and just street life in general, et cetera, et cetera, that takes place through the media, through music, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's a net, my point is, is that it's a net glorification of these lifestyles. And even though there's things said about it being negative and you hear these stories and you see people saying, don't do this, don't do this lifestyle, don't, don't get involved in this. If I had it to do all over again, I wouldn't do it, et cetera, et cetera. That pales in comparison to all these stories of grandeur and all the money and this, then, the third, and how people have literally admitted to saying, well, when I saw the mistakes that so-and-so so -and -so was making, I just took it as information on what not to do. And people still stayed in the game. People still stayed in the streets because they always feel like they can do it better and then they're not going to do the same mistakes that they see somebody else do and, and make the same mistakes because, you know, okay, I see what they were doing. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get caught up like they did. And you just get caught up in a different way, but it's a slight twist, but it's always the same thing. You know, somebody gets pinched and then they rat slash snitch, cooperate, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Or you just get caught on some technicality somewhere, something happens. Next thing you know, uh, you know, you're, you're brought up on charges or you get a uh, shot at the minimum, if not killed. Uh, so, but it's still just this, the allure of being quote unquote powerful and, and making all this money and thinking that you're going to be the smarter one and that you're going to reach this limit that you have, this set goal that you have of a certain amount of money, and then you're going to get out of the game. And, and it just never goes that way <laughs> for the most part. But so again, so watching DJ Vlad, right, as I talked about earlier, have a love-hate relationship with the guy. He has, he says and does a lot of stuff that I don't like and agree with. I don't think he's the police, but I think he does things that he's, he's not really cognizant of the ramifications of some of the things that he says and does. But in any event, when I'm, you know, ready to, criticize and talk all my smack about him then he you know puts up an interview with Smokey Robinson or you know some other legend or something you know and I'm just like oh and then you're waited with bated breath and then every every so often and just other people that are interesting again all these interviews because it seems like the guy just has this fascination with uh, crack crack dealers and that drug lifestyle. I mean, I know this is a part of urban, a lot of urban culture, but I mean, how many, how, what's the point, right? But it's just these big name people. I get it. People want to hear these stories behind these people. And a lot of them are interesting, but I just don't think he nor the guests do enough to let people know all of the various uh, places that the tentacles, do you know what I'm saying, of especially cocaine and crack dealing, what that entails and how many lives it touches and, and usually corrupts and damages and ends. And again, not that I'm perfect or not that I haven't done anything wrong or that I haven't benefited from such lifestyle. I'm just saying a not, not enough of uh, is being done to help people understand you know, again, how much and how damaging this is. And so it's a net glorification when you still talk so much about these great things in so many interviews. Now, he, I'm going to do a, a, a few videos about this guest. And again, some guests just aren't interesting. Some are very interesting. And he has other guests on like this gentleman that I'm getting ready to talk about. Um, Hector uh, Barreas. He wasn't a dealer. He was an investigator. He was a DEA agent. 
and he was undercover. He was working with cartels and working with Pablo Escobar's people, et cetera, et cetera. And this guy's story, and mostly a lot of it is centered around this Kiki uh, Camarena situation where in a nutshell, allegedly, this guy stumbled. He was another intelligence officer who stumbled across some information that he wasn't really supposed to know that allegedly would have had America allegedly working with cartels or, you know, some whatever, gang, paramilitary, contra, or whatever, groups, outfits, and helping them allegedly get drugs, massive amounts of coke into America, allegedly. And it's like this guy got kidnapped and tortured and, and died. Now, when you, if you research Kiki Camarena, you go to like Wiki, the story is going to be flavored a certain way. And if you hear Hector Berez tell it, he's not saying allegedly, and he's telling it a little bit, he's telling it differently. And a lot of people, I've come to understand, a lot of people understand the story differently than what is the official story, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? And this individual has testified in front of Congress and he's always saying, he's he's dropping names, he's talking about what happened, he knows these, this, that, and the third, you know, cartel member and what they did and this, that, and the third, you know, he's meeting and working with these people. And um, it's just a real interesting story. Uh, and the fact that he's even still alive, first off, but um, and as he says, if I'm telling a story, then why am I not arrested? Or why am I, why is nobody like saying that I'm lying or whatever, you know, or some people say that he's lying, of course, but, um, nothing's, nobody's stopping him, you know? So he's and he just has so many details where it's like, I don't know, you know? So, but one of the points I wanted to make that he talks about, and, and in this first video, I want to make this point <clears throat> just as you know, uh, something to think about. He was working with some of Pablo Escobar's people, right? Everybody knows that name. And this was back in like, you know, the eighties or whatever. <clears throat> so there was like a Colombian president, presidential nominee or whatever that was running for president. And he was big on extradition. And Pablo didn't like that because that would, if he got, if this president got into power, he would, you know, push extradition. And next thing you know, like America or other countries could basically, you know, petition or come in and, and have him removed and brought into America. Right. And be, to be tried, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't have that favoritism around you. Like you have when you're working, you know, in your own country and you have this support system that, it's paid off and all this, that, and the third. So this guy, so Pablo, and this is not a, a new case, right? But just a reminder. So he was going to assassinate this presidential candidate or whatever. Planned this elaborate situation to have the plane that he was going to be on blown up, right? had people working for him and the story he had told them was that there's going to be people on the plane whatever we need to record their conversations i'm gonna give you this duffel bag or whatever bag and it's got a recording device in it and you hit whatever button at a certain time to make sure you know so we can record but the guy didn't know that it was a bomb and they were seated strategically over the main part of the plane over the wings where the gas is to for maximum you know, detonation, et cetera, et cetera. This plane was on its way from South America, or Colombia, wherever, to California, blown up in, in midair. 107 people, innocent people, dead. His intended target missed the flight, didn't even get the flight, or for whatever reason, didn't get on that plane. So 107 people, innocent people died because Pablo Escobar, allegedly, I guess I should say, maybe, 
you know, wanted to take out this one president in order to help keep him presidential, you know, wasn't, he, wasn't even president yet, I don't guess. But in order so he could still stay on top of and, and support all that he wanted to support and needed to support in his drug operation, which is largely coke. And this is the sort of blood money that trickles this way into showing up in Greenville, South Carolina. And if you're helping to move it, you're helping support this type of activity. Not to mention this guy Kiki is another, is the only other person that I can remember in the past while to mention like in this interview, he was like, and think about how many crack babies you made or you helped create. You know, and it's just like people just forget all that goes into, you know, this world of coke and dealing drugs and, and and if you're in it, you're moving, you're a piece of it. You're moving, you're helping the machine move. And, and it's stuff like that that is the reason why, you know, and then we turn around and ask for a certain amount of reform, reform or whatever. And it's, it's like, dude, you help, how much reform would you ask for somebody who did something to a baby? You're helping create crack babies. It's just no, there's no if, ends, or buts about it. And that's just at the minimum, not to mention destroying other people, getting other people set up, robbed, killed. You know, you're a part of the system. You're a part of that machine. And we always have our explanations and excuses, et cetera, et cetera. Very thin line between the two, usually. And I just don't think there's enough talking about this, this point, so that people really start to, you know, have a negative look on selling this stuff. Like, there's, there's generally not really a, that much of a negative look on this stuff. You know, I've known several individuals who have been locked up or died. And I was just talking to a friend, um, a relatively new friend who not that long ago had a family member and I won't get specific because it would be too easy to know who I'm talking about but over over dope he the stuff that they did to this guy is like something out of a movie just right up the street here and I won't say where but literally within mile a few miles of where I live it's like something out of a movie And it's just like, but in order to make conversations in movie series, you know, interviews, shall I say, not conversations, but in order to make movie series and interviews interesting, you can't dwell on that stuff. You have to talk about all the cars and all the miles I did driving and what it was like at the parties. And, you know, it's just, to me, it's a, it's a mistake. It's a it's a big, huge mistake to give all these people platforms and to talk about this stuff and talk about this stuff over and over again ad nauseum and you not make sure that people understand some of these negative aspects so that they know and understand how far reaching this stuff is and the trail of blood that you are getting involved in. It's just, it just blows me away. Um, and, and, you know, you hear these stories or you, you come across these things that happen to people and whatnot, and they just kind of get, yeah, uh, yeah, we heard about that. And now let's talk about the movie. Uh, let's talk about the, uh, the cars. Let's talk about the money, the money. How much money at your height, how much money were you making per month or per day? And you hear these folks, it's like, what? I mean, these folks are made, you hear like Rick Ross, I don't know what, what, what this guy was saying. This guy was making it at one point, he was making like a million dollars a day or something, he said. It's just ridiculous amounts of money. And you think that doesn't make people go, wow. Or if you're still in the game, you think that's not motivational for somebody? Or is that going to make some, is that going to make somebody want to get out of the game if they're in it? 
that's not a warning. And like 5% of the interview is a warning. The rest of it is talking about mistakes that you shouldn't make if you're in the game. And everybody's like, hmm, I'm glad, I'm glad I know that. Now I'm not gonna do that. Let me go move this pack. Um, anyway, I could go on and on and on, but um, yeah. So for now, I just wanted to kind of tell that story about the, the, the plane. Oh, and three people on the ground died in that, in that, that situation too. So imagine if you're outside, you're chilling with your girl, your homeboy's over here with his girl or whatever. Hey man, what you wanted to buy? Get hit with airplane wreckage. Or you're in your house watching TV, chilling with your girl, boom, cut in half or something. Airplane wreckage fall through your house. All because of greed and drugs and needing to get this drug out so that it can get to your block and he didn't even get his intended target. And that's just one example, man. So check out this guy's interview and his story. It's crazily uh, interesting. And he tells it from a person who was inside working with these people. He has a book, The Last Narc, um, Hector Berez. It's B-E-L-L-E-R-R-E-Z, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, just crazy and just hearing the details and the stuff that he remembers and being on the inside of this stuff um, it, it's just it's real interesting it's a, it's a real good interview so I have to give Vlad props on this too and it's not the first time the guy's been interviewed but anyway peace love and light man see y'all later and um, you know try to do good peace